The church is the number one stakeholder in a community and not by our design, but by God's design. And when we don't see ourselves there, when we see ourselves as like a little frumpy situation over here, we're missing out on what God has called the church to be. It was so good to see you here. I'm so excited to just to hear your story. You are a uh, U.S. missionary, yes. right? Your credential mm -hmm. ministers with the Assemblies of God. That's, right. That's so wonderful. And serving at Convoy of Hope. It's Correct. Beautiful ministry. Uh, I, I would love for you to tell us more about that later. But how did God call you to this specific ministry and to where you are at today? How did He lead you? Uh, through different From journeys. A to B. Yeah. Well, I I always had a call on my life. Uh, separate from my husband, who's also a credential ordained minister. Uh, and we pastored for 26 years in rural America. And uh, one day he came home and he said, you know, Laurel, I just feel like we're going to make a change. And I looked at him and I said, well, great. Let me know where you end up. Because I didn't have any desire to be making any change. I loved our church. I loved our church family. We raised our children there. Uh, but you know how it is when you have one plan and then the Holy Spirit has a different plan and the, the, uh, the fight that goes on within. But as I began to submit my will and began to take on his will, the peace that comes over, and then what an amazing journey the Lord took us on. So we resigned our church. We became Assembly of God U.S. missionaries. We moved our family from Northern California to Springfield, Missouri. Wow. Yeah, big change. So uh, we and became uh, missionaries at Convoy of Hope and uh, assigned specifically to the Department of Rural Compassion. So we work in small towns in America. Mm. You are a greatest, one of the greatest resources that local pastors and ministers should have. I mean, I am so blessed to know you because your ministry is really about resourcing, empowering local churches and ministers to pastor the community, not just the church. Right. That is huge. And your ministry is just beyond uh, belief. It's amazing. We all need Laurel oh. in our life. Really, <laughs> we really do. But uh, many pastors may not be sure where to even begin when it comes to pastoring a community. They don't even know what resources are out there. They don't even know who to talk to first. So as someone who's been doing this as your life calling, what are some of the things that we need to know and who are the stakeholders that we need to start having conversations with in our community? Well, that's where we like to start. Really, our main focus is training because we want to help educate the church as to who they are in their community. This, the church is the number one stakeholder in a community and not by our design, but by God's design. And when we don't see ourselves there, when we see ourselves as like a little frumpy situation over here, we're missing out on what God has called the church to be. And so we wanna help the church recognize who they are in Christ, in their community, and then to help the church position themselves to be the stakeholder that God called them to be. And one of the ways you start is you have to recognize and, and identify who the stakeholders are in uh, your community. So we're talking like police chief and the school superintendent and uh, the movers and shakers in your town. But we don't always identify ourselves as the mover and shaker in town. Like if we were to ask the police chief, who are the stakeholders in the community? Would they name your church? Probably not. And we need to fix that. And so that's what we do. We help the church identify who they are as a stakeholder and then to help them build relationships with other stakeholders in their community. Wow, that's fabulous that we include ourselves as one of the stakeholders because really we are the salt and light to this earth. That's exactly right. And not just one of the stakeholders, we are the number one stakeholder wow. of the community. Amen. by God's design. Amen. That is so fabulous. Now, you've probably seen many people during this pandemic who have stepped out and be that salt and light and as one of the stakeholders. Could you give us one example, one or two brief examples of how those people are actually doing it? Because we can talk about this, but is it is there any tangible examples of people doing it even during this time? During this time. And it's been a challenge because, you know, we recognize that people are longing for relationship. 
And the pandemic is really regulating that uh, you can't have relationship with people. And so we have to think outside the box. How do we do that? How do we make it still work? So, I mean, we have many, many churches that are uh, meeting needs as far as food items go, those kinds of things. But even, I think it's so interesting uh, that churches that we have been working with that have kind of uh, worked through these trainings, have built these relationships with the stakeholders, one of the most exciting parts that we've seen in this pandemic is that uh, we are seeing the police chief and the mayor and school superintendents calling the church saying, will you please help us? Wow, what a thought, huh? What a concept. Isn't that what God called the church to be? Uh, What a, a place that now they are going to be walking alongside city people to help meet the needs of their community during this difficult time. Yes, that's true. Not just this during this pandemic, but there's always some sort of changes happening in our community. It could be crisis, some sort of crisis. So it's always good to know, uh, to think that we are part of the solution. Uh, maybe not one, maybe the, right? That's the, right. the most the important. The that salt is, of the earth. <laughs> yes, that's wonderful. Now that we've identified some of the stakeholders, like you said, the chief, you know, and the, the superintendent and the mayor and all of those people, it's easy to name those, but it's harder to actually get into that relationship. The how piece is very important. So what are some of the best practices for our ministers ministering in their own context of life? How can we build that relationships with the stakeholders that you mentioned? Well, one of my favorite stories is that um, in 1851, there was a man who decided he was going to build a bridge across the Niagara Gorge. That would be daunting at any time. But in 1851, when you recognize that the gorge is over 800 feet deep and it's over 200 feet wide and there's raging water underneath and he's going to build a bridge. How do you do that? So what he did is he sponsored a kite flying contest and he paid, he said, uh, I'm going to pay the boy five dollars who can fly their kite from one side of the gorge to the other. And in 1851, $5 was like (laughs) $5,000. So the day came, all the boys are lined up, and they flew their kites, and one kite landed on the other side. And they took the kite, and they took the string, and they tied it to a tree. And on the side where the boy was, they tied the string to a larger rope, and they pulled it across. And then they tied a small cable to the rope, and they pulled it across. And then they put, they took a larger cable and pulled it across. And little bit by little bit, they kept pulling it across until they he actually fulfilled his dream and built a full-fledged sus- suspension bridge large enough that would carry a freight train and all of its freight, a passenger train and all of its passengers, and it changed everything. It changed the economics. It changed how families could communicate with each other. It changed everything. And that's how we need to look at when we begin to build bridges into our community. We oftentimes want to do the really big, awesome, great, exciting, one and done thing, which is good, but it doesn't build relationships. It's much better to do something small and do it consistent. See, this great, big, amazing bridge started with a kite string. So what can we do when we think like that, a kite string? See, we would say things like, you wanna build a relationship with your police department or your fire department? Take a case of Gatorade to them. Don't take 10 cases and then never see them again. Mm -hmm. Take a case this week and then next month take another case. And then in another month take another case. And by the eighth month they're looking out the door going, when's the Gatorade coming with Pastor Mm So-and-so? That's how you build a bridge, how you build relationship with a stakeholder in your community. When they find that place with you, that relationship with you, that's when they're calling you saying, Will you please uh, help us with this pandemic? We, have, we are seeing people, uh, they're calling saying, will you please, Pastor, will you please come and help us? We're seeing the, uh, suicides go up. Is there something you can do to help us? What we've done now is we've positioned the church to be the stakeholder that God called them to be mm-hmm. by using a kite string. That is a wonderful analogy, and that is a true story. That's a true right. story, true story. Yeah. Proverbs says that a gift opens the door. 
it doesn't mean it has to be a big massive gift it could be a case of Gatorade yeah and then as you deliver that case of Gatorade you are presenting a gift of relationship That's and it. friendship exactly. and trust yes. wow I love it I love how you are making it bite size and make it possible because it seems daunting you know superintendent mayor me can i really you know but you said just one step small step at a time but consistency right. i think that's very important because as i'm also engaging in my community you know there's so many different ways to engage and commun communicate and get involved but one time it's not going to cut it no you just got to be steady show up again show up again until you realize the same people are showing up because they have the same <laughs> mindsets and goals that's right and that's the like-minded people that you want to be a relationship around to change the community around you that is so powerful so here is a, a final question for you you work through uh, many different scenarios and situations across the nation there's a dynamic of leadership in churches not one church looks the same as you know is the other everybody's different the context is different um, but we have to build relationship right and and so based on your observation what are some things that the churches are doing well and not doing well in terms of uh, building this relationship and uh, building relationship with the stakeholders specifically so I would say probably our biggest downfall, and this would be across the board, every state, uh, large, big, small, whatever size community, is again, we're Americans. We like big and bold and loud and great and grander. You know, we're not going to have an Easter hunt, hunt with, uh, you know, a thousand eggs. We want 20,000 eggs. And there's nothing wrong with an Easter egg hunt with 20,000 eggs. But if... The problem is, is it doesn't set us up to build relationship. Yeah. So it would be much better to do something small and do it consistent, and then you will have opportunity to build relationship. And then amazing things can happen. I can tell you one town that actually it was their harvest party, and uh, they worked diligently to build relationship with their city to the point where the city came back to them and said, you know what, why don't you just do the harvest party and we'll pay for it? Mm -hmm. I mean, how about that? Let's let the church be responsible for the harvest party and the city's paying for it uh, because they had relationship. So that takes time. Uh, again, we're Americans. We want them, you know, quick, 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 quick. Yeah. So if we will take a breath, and recognize how important it is. I mean, think of our relationship with Christ. Our relationship with Christ, if it wasn't a relationship, I mean, what would it be? I mean, it, it, it's a great story, it's, but it's that relationship that changes us. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't take the time to build relationship with those in our community, we are not going to have the opportunity to present who Christ really is. That is absolutely true. And you live that out so very well. You are kind of like a resource hub to the ministers around the world. Not everybody's blessed with Laurel or, or other resources, but so how can other pastors just find some of these resources that are available around them and so we can serve our community better? Well, you can always contact us at Rural Compassion. Yeah, you go to the Convoy of Hope website and you come down to Rural Compassion, or you can call Convoy and ask for our department. And depending on where you are, we can uh, we have different team members, and we'll have a team member contact you, and, uh, and we can get started. Good. That resource is available for everybody. And when you're talking about just um, being a consistent voice, that kind of tells us it's a long-term commitment. It right? is. We had another episode, an interview with Dr. Carol Taylor, and she said, don't have an exit strategy. There is no exit <laughs> strategy. You say yes, and you're saying yes to all the way until he calls you to a different platform of ministry. Right. So thank you for that reminder again. I think that's a constant message. You know, like you serve community, then serve all the way. That's right. Don't serve it half-hearted. And it, if it, when it gets hard, it's like I'm done. You know. That's right. We say till Jesus comes. Ah, that's beautiful. <laughs> yes, and amen to that. Well, Laurel, thank you so much for your ministry, your commitment, and love for pastors, ministry leaders, and the communities, and modeling it so well. Thanks for having me. Thank you.